All right. So welcome, everyone, to the April 22nd, 2015 edition of the ProfessionalVMware.com v. Brown Bag. Tonight, it's all about security with vSphere 6. Uh, Mike Foley has uh, joined us. Just Eventually. a quick... <laughs> yeah. Um, just some quick uh, show notes. You can join in on the conversation using the v Brown Bag hashtag. You can also... Uh, enter questions or leave comments in the go-to meeting window. Also remember we have other podcasts going on globally, so check those out. You can also download those shows via the, uh, from iTunes or professional VMware.com. Also keep in mind that uh, VMworld is right around the corner. So start thinking about topics for those uh, tech talks. I believe Alistair said uh, he'll make an announcement soon about uh, signups. So Stay tuned for that. Tonight's guest is Mike Foley. You can find him on Twitter at Mike Foley. I'm your host, Ahmad Yunus. Find me on Twitter at Ahmad underscore Yunus. And with that, let me – there you go, Mike. You should now have – All right. And we can't start a podcast without logging in with an RSA token, a security podcast without logging in with an RSA token. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that conference is like uh, literally right down the road uh, here in San Francisco. So. Yeah, I was going to go, but um, how do I say this nice, nicely? I talk more to VMware IT people than I do to security people because I don't <laughs> think the security people know quite what – to ask just yet, although I'm <laughs> trying to get them there. <laughs> so, and you can see that I use one password. Yay me! Um, all right, so let me uh, let me get rid of my junk stuff here. Make sure nothing inadvertent comes up. And there's my thing here and PowerPoint. Just put the webinar panel over the side. All right, so uh, my name is Mike Foley. I work in security. And uh, Frank Deniman took this photo of uh, me last week at uh, a VMUG. <laughs> and <laughs> they, those guys said, hey, are you going to stay here and leave your bags? And I, I said, uh, yeah. I said, you know, can we leave our bags with you? So. Frank took a photo, put it out on Twitter, and Jeremiah Dooley uh, started a crazy rant on uh, uh, of memes, and this was uh, probably one of my favorite ones. I said I worked in security. Idiots left their luggage with me. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about two things tonight. We're going to talk about the vSphere hardening guide. For those that uh, don't know, I'll go into a little explanation of what that is. And then we'll do uh, kind of an overview of the uh, changes that have been made in vSphere with regard to security. I will show you a little video that uh, Brian Graff uh, created. And uh, he is on the line because I got the message from him on Twitter. He's already made his popcorn. And, um, and then maybe uh, show a, a quick demo uh, around VMCA. Uh, although that may take a few minutes, so what we what I might do is after I go through the hardening guide, start the demo for VMCA uh, because it does take a little while to to chunk through, and then we'll do uh, the updates, and then we'll go back and um, show how to unwind what what we did. So hopefully that works for everyone. If there are questions, please put them in the question and answer uh, box. I'll be more than happy to answer as uh, best I can. And so for those folks that don't know what the vSphere hardening guide is, it's really focused on production ready security. The question I get all the time is, isn't vSphere hardened up by default? To which my answer is, is Windows? Is Linux? Is OS 10? Is any operating system? No. Usually when you are ready to put an operating system into production, that's when you start to apply security best practices. So really it is about preparing, uh, the guide is really a list of things that you use to prepare the system for operational uh, readiness. 
uh, things like auditing, forensics, control, things like Active Directory users, NTP, syslog, what values you should have in certain settings from a best practices standpoint. And I'll go into some of those later. Um, it does disable certain ease of use features. It wouldn't be security if we took away ease of use. And uh, you know, most uh, some ease of use features are there out of the box to assist for in things like POC and test environments. But once you go into production, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have those anymore. Things like oh, I don't know, password policies. Um, the the intent of any hardening guide is always to reduce attack surface, and. Uh, in, in some cases, in some classes of customers, they think that anything that has a setting should have a value. Even if there's no code behind that setting, there might be code in the future. You wonder where they get the paranoia from. And, uh, you know, it, it's, if you're not using functionality, they want to be able to turn it off. So that's uh, all part of reducing attack surface. So why does it exist? The, it exists because uh, customers have asked for it. It exists because all of the guidelines that are in the hardening guide are then fed into different compliance standards. So SOX, HIPAA, DISA, PCI, uh, PCI is probably the only one that Europe knows uh, intimately familiar with. Most of the, the rest of these are all uh, US based. But if you think about, say, PCI, for example, it will have a – it's what you would call an authoritative source. And what you want to be able to do is map a uh, regulation in the source to a guideline within the vendor's best, uh, best security practices documentation. And that is what the hardening guide is. It is below – these compliance standards. I had one customer ask, uh, one uh, TAM asked me the other day, um, if I just set all of my stuff to risk profile two in the hardening guide, am I PCI compliant? And I said, no. And he said, well, why not? Because you're, hard, you're compliant to risk profile two of the hardening guide. In order to find out if you're PCI compliant, you're going to use a tool that measures against PCI, which will then go check the values that are called out in the hardening guide. So that's how, that's really why it exists and where it exists in, in the world. Uh, it does make the product less susceptible to threats and vulnerabilities, but make no mistake, vSphere out of the box with none of the hardening guide settings applied passes common criteria at a fairly uh, decent level. So if you can say, is it hardened out of the box? I'm going to go with, yeah, this is just cranking the knob up to 11 uh, on some cases. So we have our first question. Sure. <laughs> I think it's a little bit sarcasm, but <laughs> why is not there? Seeing, I'm not seeing the questions. Oh, I'll see the questions. Oh, I'll, hold on. I only see show answered questions. Nope. Yeah. So okay, go ahead. Uh, why isn't there a little button that says make secure? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can we get a little further into my uh, presentation and I will address that uh, painful issue? Uh, <laughs> sure. I have heard I have heard that question loud and clear and with the magnificent assistance of uh, Mr. Brian Graff, who is on the tech marketing team and is a uh, power CLI lad, uh, uh, or did I just give up his secret identity? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he, um, he is uh, helping in that endeavor, and uh, actually he's, he's doing that endeavor. And um, I'll get into that and try and address that in, in a little bit. Cool. So the vSphere hardening guide really should be used not as a tool by the security guy to walk in, dump on your desk, and say, you need to be compliant to the hardening guide. If, if he does it, you turn around and say, you're not doing your job. It really is a tool to generate the discussion of risk management. There may be guidelines in there that don't apply in your environment or guidelines in there that can't be implemented in your environment. 
and each one of those guidelines excuse me each one of those guidelines should be discussed between the IT guy and the security guy and go through the list one by one and help him understand what it does and help him uh, understand what it doesn't do. In addition to the hardening guide, uh, there is a fantastic vSphere security guide that has been getting updated over the past couple of releases uh, by uh, someone on the documentation team. Uh, her name is Renata, and she does an amazing job uh, and has been doing like really yeoman's work to get the vSphere security guide into a far better place than it was a number of years ago. And I really encourage you, if you haven't looked at it recently, look at it soon. So major improvements to the hardening guide. Uh, let me start by saying the old, the old guide was a real pain in the neck to make. It, uh, everything was done within Excel, and for those of you that know Excel, um, you know, don't throw up in your mouth a little bit, uh, but uh, it is not exactly the best tool to be editing text and uh, tracking changes and everything else. I know many people uh, use it as a database, but it's not. It did contain this mix of what I'll call operational guidance, which is how you use the product, and programmatic guidance, which is more along the lines of what is the, what is the uh, setting and what is the value. It was really difficult to understand because it was all jumbled in together. And uh, operational guidance by its nature is very difficult to measure. I really have to ask you, did you do it? Which gets back to that easy button that everybody wants, right? So the new guide, much easier to produce. Uh, I can show you uh, very quickly on my screen here. Everything is done in SharePoint. I can right click on a, uh, an item in the guide and you can see I can go ahead and edit all of this. I can add in change log stuff. I've added a bunch of comments, a bunch of fields that I use that I don't necessarily publicly distribute. And, uh, you know, it, it stores all the change logs, although I'm having a little difficulty getting that information out of SharePoint. And so, yeah, there's a, it, it's much, much easier now. I can enforce rules of what the type of content is. I can change things so that, you know, uh, we don't get misspellings because you can only select one type of thing. Let me go back to the thing. And uh, so for me, I can now spend more time on the content and less time on the production. It was really 80% production, 20% content the past couple of releases. And now I think that has uh, done a complete 180 and now we're closer to 20% production and 80% um, 80 content. The focus of the hardening guide is now almost solely on programmatic guidance. I want, I really do want the easy button. I want you to have the easy button. Why do I want you to have the easy button? Because maybe then you'll press it. If it's too difficult to implement, too difficult to understand, I'm putting the onus on you to try and decipher it. And, uh, and quite honestly, you probably have better things to do. If security is difficult or uh, uh, intrusive, people won't do it, right? It, it's just human nature. And uh, I, as it says here, easier to implement. I'll get into that in a little bit. So this whole uh, uh, hardening guide, um, programmatic guidance versus operational guidance, um, the hardening guide is now focused on setting up the product in a secure manner, making things easy to test and, uh, or in security speak, assess, is this value set to true, for example. The, the eventual goal uh, of the hardening guide is to be almost totally automatable. Now, what about all the operational stuff? That's how you use the product. So an, op an example of operational guidance would be um, put your ESX server uh, and vCenter, excuse me, vCenter management interfaces on a separate management LAN. Well, okay, how? 
Do I use VLANs? Do I use separate physical networks? Do I use a combination of both? Uh, quite frankly, that type of guideline can be addressed or mitigated in multiple ways. It's very, very site specific, right? It takes the discussion of architecture, policy, use case, risk. It may require cross-functional support across an enterprise. I may need to get the security team to actually help me out. I may need to get the security, the, uh, the network team to implement a lot of this stuff. So I can't really dictate that you must do this. What I can say is if you're going to run your, produ your production environment in a secure fashion, these are the best practices. These are the best practices that uh, uh, will help you do that but you have to figure out those based on your site specific requirements. And this whole issue of manual attestation, what that is is essentially saying, um, Mike, did you set up the vSphere and ESX management inter interfaces on a separate management LAN that only admins have access to? Why, yes, yes I did. Okay, sign here. When you start talking about governance, risk and compliance, those are, and auditing, and we all know auditors are some of our favorite people, um, though, someone has to actually sign their name and be responsible for doing that. It's very different from running a PowerShell script and saying, yep, that value's true. So all of that operational guidance is now being moved over to the vSphere security guide. And when the hardening guide finally ships, I will be shipping an Excel spreadsheet that has the, uh, the old guidelines that moved over to, to operational guidance or into the, do, into the documentation and a link to where they are in the documentation. And uh, that is where they will uh, uh, live moving forward. Not to say you shouldn't do them, but these are, these are what the ones that you're going to be spending more time talking to your auditor, talking to your security guys, talking to your business people over what really needs to be done in your business. And now that means the hardening guide is focused on making sure all of the settings that are programmatically accessible can be checked, tested, and set in a secure fashion. It, I've talked with Fed people, finance people, auditors, um, all sorts of different large and small businesses about this. And what they're saying to me is, this will make my life easier with the auditor, because now I can just set all the settings. We can have that, that deeper discussion as to how we use the product in a secure fashion. So we did this for 6.0 because, well, it's a dot zero release. And uh, you know, it's our first major release in what, like four years or so. And what that gives you is that opportunity to knock down the, the Jenga tower. And uh, that's what I've done. So I tore apart the hardening guide. I went out to Palo Alto a number of times. I don't, I'm not from that area. I live in Massachusetts. Um, I went out to Palo Alto a number of times, met with all different engineering teams in the vSphere space. And we went through every single guideline. And we updated a number of them. We added a couple, like the transparent page sharing settings. We removed a bunch, like the VM safe settings. Those, uh, that, that was a security program that was in place around the 5.0 timeframe. And all of that code's been yanked out uh, because for various reasons. So um, when you start thinking about, you know, if you think of the, the hardening guide as a list of firewall rules, Nobody wants to touch the firewall rules because they're afraid they're going to break something. And I just went full in a china shop and uh, broke everything and went, oh, well. And that has given us a, the ability to take a fresh look at every single guideline. And as before, it's going to be delivered as an Excel spreadsheet and also as a PDF document. I can show you an example of that uh, right here. Hold on. Guide six zero, quick beta, PDF, and you can see. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Um, 
this was done using Excel and Word and Mail Merge. So uh, I'm actually thinking of uh, publishing the, the Word doc for this so that you guys can customize it to your own, to your own liking. Oh. All right, so uh, there's a new taxonomy with the hardening guide. Um, if you looked at the old ones, they were an Excel spreadsheet with a whole bunch of tabs. In order to make Brian's life easier, uh, rather than having to go through every tab and then go through every guideline and try and sort them out, I just changed the taxonomy to be a flat namespace. So what was enable remote syslog is now esxi.enable remote syslog. That means I can then do things like vcenter.enable remote syslog. Now every single guideline is unique. And this is really more about automation enablement. So this is the first step in where I see things. Um, once I get all of this, this heavy lifting done, then folks like Brian, like others, can now take that and go, oh, I can automate that. This is a lot easier to automate. And the only way to do security at scale is through automation. There's the, the old days of going in and tinkering everything one by one by one. How do you do that when you have 3,000 ESX servers and 30,000 VMs? You can't. You have to leverage automation. So the public beta is available today. If you go on the vSphere blog, there's a blog on that. And you can download the Excel spreadsheet. You can download that PDF. Uh, if folks want the Word doc, please let me know. I'll be happy to make that available. And, uh, you know, please send feedback. The, um, the hardening guide is one of those things that everyone asks, asks for six months before general, uh, general availability of the product, demands two months before general availability, availability of the product, and is wondering, is Foley even doing his job on the GA date? Um, things change when you develop software, especially large amounts of software like vSphere. Things can change right up until release time. I don't really start work on the hardening guide until uh, around the release candidate time frame because by then I'm assured that things are going to be a lot more stable. And the, um, the public message I've said about the release of the hardening guide will be one quarter after the GA of the product. Um, I got the public beta out uh, in less than uh, one month. So trying to get there. It's a, it's a very detailed amount of work and it, it takes quite a bit of time and effort. So we talked about automation. If anyone uh, knows PowerShell, they know something like this, right? So let me show you what Brian's been working on. This is our vSphere hardening guide automation sneak peek. How about some hardening guide uh, PowerShell modules? So I can now do things like dumping out uh, the list of what is in the hardening guide. <clears throat> um, I'm sure to cut that one down a little shorter. And it does things like intelligent command completion. So I can do now compare hardening guide dash type equals SSO or dash type equals vCenter comma SSO. And in this example, I'm going to iterate through a, a virtual machine using type VM and check and see, and I see disabled ex unexposed features auto login is set to true. And that's, that's not a string, that's an object, which means now you can go do other stuff based on that value. Makes it easy to output HTML reports. And uh, I think it's going to be extremely popular because now you'll be able to just set all your values uh, relatively easily and quickly. So now everyone wants to know. We're going to put Brian on the spot. Brian, when are we going to get those uh, hardening guide PowerShell commandlets or modules? when they are done. The dude has a lot on his plate. He's doing amazing work and uh, it's gonna be really cool when they come out and hopefully we'll get them out to you uh, sooner rather than later. So 
the vSphere 6 security update. Before I start that, let me zip over here. And you'll see that I'm logged into my lab and, um, yeah, Adobe Flash. Um, and the connection is secured because I've downloaded the root certificate and installed it in the trusted root store. But what if I want to change, um, what, if, what if I want to change the root certificate? What if I feel, uh, well, I want my own, you know, I, I didn't take the default that came with, with v, uh, VMCA, I want to do my own. So um, what I really want to do is regenerate a new VMCA root certificate and then replace all the certificates. Now, if you're using VMCA, you don't have to go to every ESX server and push a new cert and everything else. VMCA will do all of that for you. So if I do number four, give my valid SSO password, um, do I wish to reconfigure? Yes, I do. Uh, US, um, I'm going to call that Mike. Yellow.com, Yellow Engineering, Massachusetts, Hubbardston. I had already done this to check it out. I'm going to do no IP address, me at yellow.com. That is fully spelled backwards. Uh, host name, I'm going to vcsa.lab.local. And do I want to regenerate? Yes. So that's going to take uh, a little bit of time uh, to stop services and restart services. So while that's doing that, uh, we will go back to the, power, uh, the uh, PowerPoint and uh, continue on with the vSphere security update. Hey, Any Mike. questions before we start that? Yeah, so we, we do have one question. Is there sure. going to be an option to set hardening policies when creating a VM, et cetera? So what you're asking for is the ability to uh, right-click, create a virtual machine, and um, make sure that it comes out of the box with all the hardening guide stuff set. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's what the user is asking for. Yeah, that that's not there. Um, what you will be able to do is with the PowerShell modules is to be able to apply all those settings relatively easily uh, in a scripted fashion. So if you're creating a virtual machine, uh, you could use uh, uh, vCenter Orchestrator to create that. You could use vRealize Automation and go ahead and because everything that's in the hardening guide uh, should be programmatically accessible, uh, you will be able to go ahead and, and create those virtual machines. This is something that, that keeps coming up uh, internally. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot of folks saying, well, why can't I just create stuff by default that has all the things in it? You, William Lamb actually, it, it couldn't be a podcast without a VMware podcast without mentioning William's name. Uh, <laughs> William Lamb uh, actually uh, talked about uh, editing a config file on, on vCenter that will allow you to do that, but it doesn't populate all the, the entries with the values that you need so that when you go to check them, uh, they show up as null. And that's not really what you want to do. You really want to go in and, and set all those settings. So um, that, that kind of brings up a bigger question of uh, ta what, what the question really brings up is, how do I convert tasks like creating VM into policies? And that's when you really need to use a layer above vCenter in order to do that. Now, whether that layer is a PowerShell script, a full-blown vRealize automation, a combination of PowerShell and VRO, um, or, or a solution like HITRUST or what have you, that really, all that sort of uh, stuff really needs to happen at a layer above vCenter. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. We also have another question. Um, let's see. So if you had a real public cert, like a wildcard cert, can that oh, be... Oh, don't do wildcard cert. <laughs> <coughs> uh, can that be pushed out similar to what you're doing? Um, don't do wildcard certs. It's really not designed for it. Uh, it's not a very secure method. 
um, you're really just checking the box at that stage to get the security guy off your back. If you already have an existing PKI, you can issue VMCA a subordinate cert, and then it can then issue certs that chain up to your existing um, PKI. If you're buying your certs off of Verisign, uh, if that's the thing and you just want to buy the one cert, um, I don't know if that would be supported. I don't think it is doing wildcard certs that way. So if, if, if you do have an existing CA, um, there already is capabilities in the tools, uh, the, the cert manager tools for addressing how to create all of the certs, all of the, CS, uh, the CSRs and make that process a little bit easier. Uh, Derek Seaman has written some really great scripts in order to, to automate an awful lot of that stuff. Um, you know, I would look into that before I'd start looking at wildcard certs. Uh, let's see. Well, this is, seems to be a long one. Uh, in the future power CLI hardening guide commandlet, roughly what percentage of the guide is targeted to be covered? Uh, let's see. I understand there's so, a manual items that can relate to operation policy process. Items cannot be automated, but still appears to be items that cannot be checked via API. Yeah. So, um, the hard, the goal of the hardening guide is to eventually become 100% automatable and any new additions to the guide if someone internally says, I want to see this in the hardening guide, if I say, unless it has, an a unless it has the ability to be changed by an API, it goes into the, v the vSphere security documentation. Right? Uh, does that sort of answer the question? Chris, does that answer your question? I'm being a real automation Nazi here. I, 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 if I can't fix it with an API or, or, or a commandlet or some other sort of way, it ain't going in the guide. And the operational guidance stuff, that is, those are deeper discussions that are outside the scope of the hardening guide, in my opinion, moving okay. forward. Chris says he's going to take this offline with you. Sure. Send me an email. Okay, um, so I've, uh, going back to uh, uh, VCSA, I've replaced the, I've regenerated all new certs, root certs for, for VMCA. Uh, let me close my browser and then go back in and I should get the dreaded, uh, I don't understand, you know. I, I no longer have a trusted connection, which really sucks, right? I mean, if we, if we look at the technical details, it's using an invalid cert because it's not in the trusted roots uh, cert. So maybe I, I hit that one by mistake and now I want to back out. So if I close this, rerun cert manager, and say revert to last performed operation, that will go ahead and move all of those certs that I had been using before back into place and restart all the services for me. Oh. Yes, I do. And that will take a little while to, to restart all the services and uh, push all the certs backwards. So this really should be five security enhancements in vSphere 6 because I'm really not going to be talking about the added certificate-based guest authentication. That's a feature more for uh, service providers and not necessarily for VI admins. Uh, if anyone really wants to know about that, I'll be happy to uh, talk about them offline. So lockdown mode, I've already published a couple of blogs on lockdown mode. 
nobody is using lockdown mode today because it, uh, well, it locks them out. It's, uh, it's a very brutish sort of way to uh, make your life very difficult in order to get, quote unquote, secure. With version six, there's two types of lockdown mode. There's normal and strict. In normal no lockdown mode, we don't stop DCUI. Uh, you have to add users to the DCUI access list who can access DCUI. Root is always on there by default, although you can remove root. In strict lockdown mode, uh, you cannot even log in via the DCUI. So that brings up the new concept of these things called exception users. And I did a really long blog on that uh, a few weeks ago. Exception users can be either local host or AD users with permissions that are defined locally on the host. And those are usually accounts that you're going to use as service accounts, not as, oh, I'm just gonna put all my admins in the exception users, um, exception users list you've just kind of defeated the whole purpose of lockdown mode, right? Um, you can add the users from the vSphere client, and as I said, it's not recommended for general user accounts, or I should say admin accounts. And as far as shell and SSH uh, independency, if a user is registered in exception users, and has it the full administrator role on the box, they can SSH into the uh, into ESX or use the ESXi troubleshooting shell during any lockdown mode. So having your full blown admins on the exception users list now leaves your ESX servers open for people banging on uh, the ESX server via SSH because of course you've turned SSH on because how else would you get in without lockdown mode. So what you really want to consider is, uh, and I'm talking about this with one of the engineers right now, is um, limit strongly who has access to ESX. Uh, the blog goes through a scenario as to why you would want to use exception users. At the minimum, please use normal lockdown mode. And if you have someone that needs uh, vSphere API access directly to the ESX server, can't go through vCenter, read my exception users blog and that will show you how to address that. And you can uh, enable or disable lockdown mode and add exception users in the vSphere uh, API. And in the spirit of automation. Um, Brian, I'm going to keep throwing Brian uh, above the bus this time. Um, Brian uh, has uh, figured out how to change lockdown mode from PowerShell. It changed from the the get view command that was used before. Um, there's uh, because we now have lockdown strict and lockdown normal. Um, some of that code had to change a little bit, but uh, it's very easy to uh, turn on and turn off lockdown mode uh, via PowerShell if you have access. So with that, a uh, number of settings in the hardening guide are being either removed or reclassified. Don't use the word, I've removed, disabled DCUI. Use strict lockdown mode or don't put the user on the DCUI access list if you're using normal. Uh, disable ESX shell, it's disabled by default. I'm leaving it there purely as an auditable setting. If someone turned uh, disable ESXi shell off, uh, that would be something I would want to audit. The same with SSH. By default, it's turned off. If it, if it gets turned on, you probably want to know why and who. So enable, instead of enable lockdown mode, there's now two settings, uh, enable strict or enable normal. And the question of which lockdown mode should I choose, at least use normal, preferably strict if, you, if your environment calls for it. But really, at the end of the day, the vSphere hardening guide is a set of guidelines. It's not a set of mandates. Um, it's not something you have to be compliant to. It's something that uh, you should be using and deciding which is appropriate for you. If there's any Fed folks on the phone call, um, 
we now have CAC card and PIV support logging into the DCUI. Uh, the vSphere web uh, client has all the, the bits to enable smart card authentication. Um, you need to use Active Directory because each server must be part of an Active Directory domain. And uh, when Active Directory is unreachable, excuse me, um, it falls back to username password. When vCenter is unreachable, it will still work if Active Directory is available. And if lockdown mode is enabled, the smart card user must be on the exception users list. Uh, in, in normal and in strict, uh, there's no DCUI logins of any type, so the CAC card isn't going to work. There's some new ESX CLI commands, the ability to create, list, remove, and modify local user accounts. Uh, same with permissions. You can list, set, and remove permissions for a user group for those folks that really love to use ESX CLI. For account lockout and for password policies, all of these things are uh, or password complexity rules. These are two things that uh, we got into host advanced settings, which now means a simple PowerShell command uh, procedure and you can set all of your hosts password policies to be the same with just a couple lines of PowerShell. For the folks that love to collect logs and spend their evenings pouring through the logs to figure out who did what, when, where, and how, um, in, five, in 5.x the logs were, uh, it was difficult from a forensic standpoint to figure out what user action that was initiated on vCenter was then run against the ESX server. So if you look at the first log uh, from Log Insight here, you'll see that uh, when um, Corp Administrator changed the host, host agent log level value to info from vCenter, it was the VPX user that um, it was the VPX user that actually initiated the change on the ESX server. So vCenter told VPX user, go make this change. Okay, but how do I track who did what, when, where, and how? It falls off the list of, of users. In version six, you'll see uh, it not only incorporates user VPX user, but also the username of the vCenter user who made the change. So now I can do show me all changes that uh, Mike Foley made and get a complete list of vCenter and ESX changes um, that were initiated. So we do understand that uh, logging uh, could be better in vSphere and uh, that is something we are uh, working hard at. Hey Mike, so we have a question. Sure. Can the password uh, complexity rules interface with AD policy? If, you're, you, if you have AD users on your ESX servers, those password policies will be coming from AD. The password policies are for local user accounts on ESX. That makes sense? Yep. Okay. So if we uh, just jump back to our environment here, uh, I had uh, reverted all of my stuff and you will see that I'm actually getting the nice little lockbox that says verified by the previous certificate. So if you do screw up, you do have the ability to set things back to the way they were using the certificate manager tool. Hopefully that was helpful for folks. Okay, um, so back to certificates. There are two new components within uh, certificates. There's VMCA, which is the VMware Certificate Authority, and there is VEX, which is the VMware Endpoint Certificate Service. And just like it's named, uh, the VMware Certificate Authority is a CA, and it's not a CA to be used for you know, general certificates, a replacement for your Microsoft CA. It is purely for the VMware components. And a big change from the 5.5 five days 
is all of the certs, excuse me, all of the certs no longer um, are just sitting in the file system protected by OS permissions. They are all stored within VEX. So VEX is kind of like a distributed key store. And that's where all the certificates uh, will live. So while you may choose to not use VMCA, you will have to use VEX. So, and one of the things you will have to do is if you're saying, ah, I don't trust VMCA, I just want to load up all my own certs that I'll get from my own CA, uh, you have to load them into VEX and you also have to load in the root cert so that those certs can chain. Um, VEX is not uh, on ESXi and uh, that means all ESXi certs are stored locally on the host. So there's um, three different certificate replacement op options for, for vSphere. You can use VMCA in default mode. We just showed that as part of the demo where VMCA provides its own root certificate. It issues certificates to solution users and to ESX hosts. And those certificates that it issues chain to VMCA. And as you could see, it was very easy to regenerate certificates and also roll back to the previous uh, set of certs. Now, uh, not only did that, when I did all that rolling back and generating of certs, it not only did that for, for my vCenter, it also did that for my ESX server. If you say, well, I, would, I like the concept of VMCA, but it has to change to my enterprise certificate authority, then you can set up VMCA as a subordinate CA and issue it a, uh, go to your, your, um, your certificate authority, issue a subordinate CA certificate for VMCA and then replace VMCA's root cert with that uh, subordinate cert. And when that happens, VMCA will regenerate all of the certs on all of the components that it manages to chain up to the enterprise PKI. And as I mentioned, you can disable VMCA if you're one of those super ultra paranoid people. You're probably not on the phone right now because you know the NSA is listening. Um, you can disable VMCA, provision all your own custom certs. The certificate manager utility will help you with that. It's uh, much more complicated and uh, really it's for the, those ultra highly security conscious uh, customers uh, who are, um, would fall under the risk profile one category of the hardening guide. For um, ESXi certificate provisioning in VMCA, when you start up ESXi, it will always have an auto-generated cert. You can't preload it. Um, when you add it to vCenter, VMCA does all of the provisioning, pushes down the new uh, cert that VMCA issues, uh, and, uh, you know, Bob's your uncle. If you're using auto deploy, the signed cert is stored by the auto deploy server in its local cert store and then is reused on boot. If VMCA, excuse me again, yeah. it always happens when I talk a lot. <laughs> if, uh, if VMCA is not available, I'm boring myself. If VMCA is not available, then the host will cycle through and sh a shutdown and reboot cycle until VMCA. Uh, becomes available. So if you're seeing that uh, that happening, you rebooted a host and then it just starts sitting there and it continually reboots, make sure the VMCA is up and running. Uh, if you already have custom certs installed, VMCA will not overwrite those. And there's the location for the certificate manager utility and that's what it looks like uh, when you run it. Uh, it does simplify uh, third-party cert uh, management. Uh, it does, as I demonstrated earlier, it does revert to last performed operation. You can easily regenerate uh, new VMCA routes. We showed that. No more fumbling with OpenSSL and VEX uh, CLIs. Uh, that's my favorite thing. And uh, it will even generate the certificate signing requests as necessary. That was one of the, uh, the big things that uh, we were finding with customers is they would generate CSRs that didn't have all the right attributes, go off and go get a cert, install it, and then nothing would work, and they'd call up GSS, 
and you know an hour later of, uh, of of debug and we found out that they generated the wrong start signing request so use your uh, use the utility if you if you're going to be using uh, third party starts so we have a few more questions sure all right so the first one is will vmca act as a ca for the nsx components uh, manager controller L lbs uh, vpns etc um, you will have to ask the NSX guys what their plans are for that. I'm, I'm really not privy to, to what they're, they're doing there. Okay. And the next one is, so can we install with the defaults and then move to enterprise later? Yes. So if I go back a few, um, so you can install with the default and then um, issue eventually issue the VMCA a subordinate CA cert to replace its own root cert, and then once you do that, uh, it, VMCA will automatically regenerate all the new certs that so that they chain up to the PKI. Okay. Uh, certificate replacement options for ESXi, if you're using VMCA, it takes care of everything. You don't have to do anything. Uh, if you're using a custom CA mode, um, it, it does require you to push new certs out manually. And uh, if you have, um, uh, there's this thing called thumbprint mode, and thumbprint mode is how uh, vSphere 5.x and earlier uh, verified certificates. So when you added a host to vCenter, it would grab the thumbprint of the SSL uh, certificate and store that in the VM in the VC database. And it then it would always uh, check that thumbprint to ensure that it hasn't changed. And that's that's how um, certificates were done in the 5.x days. If you have a 5.5 server in a 6.0 vCenter, it's still going to be using thumbprint mode. You have to be at version 6 on the on ESX to be able to let VMCA manage it. So uh, as we mentioned, what has not, not changed for ESXi is uh, if you're going to replace third-party certs, you're still going to use the, the same tools uh, you may have used before. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, you're going to have to update the trusted root store with Invex on vCenter with the root cert of your, P, of your PKI that your third-party certs, if you're one of those ultra-paranoid people, if, if you're going to install third-party certs, you're also going to have to install the root cert for those certs in the trusted root store. So, that's about the end of my power, death by PowerPoint. And that's what I had for content. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Wow, that came right down to 925. <laughs> so let's see what we have here. Um, okay, Brian Graff has uh, left the building. Oh, he has all sorts of questions. Next. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Is an enterprise cert from AD counted as a third-party cert? Yes, that would that would be that would be an enterprise certificate. One thing that you'll need to know is that uh, if you if you do install an enterprise cert, a subordinate cert from, say, you go to your Microsoft Certificate Authority. You get your subordinate cert from there. You install it on VMCA. You have to wait 24 hours. Uh, it's just how certs work. Uh, you'll have to wait 24 hours before that cert uh, kind of um, um, gets to the point where you can then issue certs. So that's something to plan for. I believe that's called out in the documentation. Let's see. So the next question, can you talk a bit, um, give an overview of the certificate based guest authentication, not a lot of coverage on the net. Oh, okay, sure. Let me unhide those, uh, let me unhide those slides. 
go to this one. Play from current slide. I haven't I haven't uh, gone through this in a while. <clears throat> so let, before I dive into this, this this uh, functionality is really there uh, for folks that are service provider-ish type of folks, where you're going to have an application that uses um, uh, it, 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 it's a way to span multiple administrative domains. So if I have, um, say I'm a service provider and I have Coke and Pepsi, right? And I'm providing a service to Coke and Pepsi that goes into each of their, um, uh, their VMs and runs a script. Maybe it's doing some type of audit, right? And that's, that's one of my value adds as, as a service provider. Do I, uh, this allows the, uh, the Coke and Pepsi folks to map a username in the, in the guest with a username in the service provider's infrastructure. Does that make sense? So it allows you to map an infrastructure admin to a guest or user or admin. It's SAML based. Um, SSO certs uh, from vSphere for vSphere users and guest users provide the chain of trust. It does span multiple guest authentication domains. So if you're, do, you're doing Coke, Pepsi, Pola Cola, um, you have multiple authentication domains all being accessed by a single infrastructure domain. And, it, you know, it might be things uh, for backup, it might be things for SRM reconfiguration, that sort of stuff. That's really what it's geared towards. So if I look here, uh, I've got the username Corp App one and that's my external solution user account credentials. It, uh, I go SSO, SSO gives me a SAML token. That token goes to a vSphere solution. Right, so the user makes a request to the vSphere solution, the SAM, and I pass the SAML token to that that solution. The vSphere solution acts on the request, calling the vSphere APIs in vCenter, passing the SAML token into the guest, where it's then acted upon. Within the guest, that SAML token, <coughs> excuse me. That SAML token uh, goes into the guest agent, which has an authentication service. And the guest agent says, validate the SAML token from vCenter. And that is where the user mapping of, say, Corp App 1 turns into guest user 2. So the authentication service can take that, can verify the, the external SAML token, uh, which is tied to a user and then do the mapping. So now the uh, cert app one user two, uh, corp app one uh, equals user two, that can now map um, to guest user two, which would then allow that, that infrastructure account to run a, say an SRM re-IP config script in the virtual machine under the username of guest user two. So another Does that question. make sense to the folks that we're asking? Yes. They added on another question on top of what you just – Sure. Uh, so is this guest agent functionality part of the VM, VMware tools? Um, I, I, it's been months since I did these particular slides. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Um, I think the guest agent – might be part of VMware tools. <laughs> I think that's that's probably that that's something you're probably going to have to dive into the documentation. If the documentation is uh, um, less than helpful, send me an email with a list of questions, and I will make sure that the the uh, the engineers who came up with this uh, really cool stuff uh, will get those questions. I'll see if I can get them answered for you. Awesome, man! You're generating a, a bunch of questions here. Oh, great. <laughs> Questions about security? Well, yeah. it is 9.30. Everybody's probably drunk by now, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, My wine is in the house breathing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
All right. Let's Hopefully see. My dog is too. Wow. Um, let's see. Please provide well, an example. the questions. <laughs> Um, let's see. P please provide an example of a cert slash PKI instance that is listed in the beta version of the hardening guide. Uh, cert slash PKI instance. Can you tell me which guideline that was? Uh, let's see. Jason Kane is the guy asking the question. So, Jason, can you elaborate? Just tell me which guideline. Let's see. He just responded. Just, uh, just looking for a sample example. Not sure which one. Oh, uh, I'm I'm not exactly sure which hardening guide stuff you're uh, talking about. To be quite honest with you, I'm I'm looking through and I don't see it standing out. Um, there's only a couple of SSO ones. I'm going to look down through vCenter. Thought I had vCenter in here. Hmm. I'm going to look. I don't think I shipped vCenter in those. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, oops, I don't, uh, I, I, I need a little more context. If you want, you can send me email. Okay. Let's see. Next one is any pointers to why not to use a wild card certificate, certif certificates, man, I can't get it out today. I don't have those at my fingertips. It's buried somewhere in my brain. Um, Send me an email. I'll try and find the, quick, the answer for you. Okay. But think of it this way. If you're using a wildcard cert and you have wildcard certs all through your vCenter environment, it's uh, I only have to spoof the wildcard cert. You know, if I get a copy of the wildcard cert, I can get into any aspect of your infrastructure. Uh, it's uh, It's just... It's just kind of sloppy security practice. Let's see. Uh, I suspect one of the... your auditor will probably say no. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, well, there is a request. What's your email? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ryan Doc Raff at no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's mfoley at vmware.com, m-f-o-l-e-y at vmware.com. Okay. Right now, let's see. Looks like we are good. Any more questions? Now's the chance. Okay, it looks like uh, you may have answered all the questions. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we spoke too soon. Oh, there's more. Yes. No, wait, and, there's more. <laughs> value add. In the vSphere infrastructure, can you leverage any other... Um, hold on the screen. Let's see. Sam, IDP instead of SSO? Ah. Um, if you do look at, let me see if I can uh, um, bring that up. So what you want to use is an external IDP to log into vCenter. And that is something we are that there is uh, some level of support, but like uh, with many things, um, you're not seeing a whole lot in there today because it probably hasn't gotten a lot of QE testing. 
So you would probably want to use like a, a Microsoft ADFS or something along that lines. Uh, let log in via that, then get redirected to vCenter with a SAML token. vCenter goes, oh, yay, it's you, and, and logs you directly in. I really like that type of solution, and it's kind of on my list. If I can spell administrator. Um, it's on my list of things to try out. Um, when I was uh, with the SSO group a few months ago, um, I got a, a, a pointer to an internal wiki that describes how to do it. I just haven't had the, the cycles to set up that whole infrastructure and try it out. Um, I believe it will work. And I think if you were to put in a call uh, to GSS, you'd probably get a best case because it's not clearly documented, which means it's probably not clearly um, supported. But certainly something we would like to hear more about. So F5 uh, APM, for example? Um, I, I don't know if that's one of the ones they were playing around with. I think they did try Microsoft ADFS. Um, but um, yeah, so see, here's your identity provider screen under SSO configuration. Um, it, if you have other external identity providers, you can use them as well. Inform this identity provider of each external SAM service provider. Inform each external SAM service provider of, of this identity provider. And you inform these services about one another using metadata XML files. I don't know how much of this is documented. If you can't find it in the documentation, then it's um, probably not supported just yet. That's not to say, because it's in the UI, that it won't be supported better in a future release. I love the concept. Um, I, I, I think being able to do your authentication using an external solution that supports whatever type of authentication method you want, whether it's knowledge-based auth, SMS tokens, secure ID tokens, uh, certs, whatever, you know, username, password, whatever you want, let it do the authentication and then just pass a SAML uh, token to vCenter and log you in. I really like that concept. Um, stay tuned. That's, a, that's probably all I can say right now. <laughs> all right. Any more questions? Well, we have only three people drop off. We're doing all right. <laughs> okay. Looks like no more questions right now. Yeah, so if you guys come up with questions, you now have my email. Please send me an email. If you have, um, if you, have uh, um, you know, what, what happened to this particular guideline, I can help you there around the hardening guide. Uh, if you have things that say this really should be in the hardening guide, please send it to me. If you find a mistake, please send it to me. If you have blog ideas, hey, Mike, I'd like you to blog about this so that I can figure out how to do that, send that to me. Um, I will get to it as, as soon as I can. It's not like I don't have a lot on my plate. I, at, at VMware, we all have a lot on our plates. Um, but, you know, it, it always helps. It, the, when I see people asking questions, um, that gives me the ability to prioritize which ones to, ask, to answer first. I think right now the only outstanding question is regarding uh, the NSX one. Yeah, that you're going to have to ask the NSX folks for. Okay. I may just tweet that out and see if somebody will, uh, will respond to that one. Um, so <laughs> somebody's asking if they can uh, leave their suitcase with you. Um, I don't know. Do you have a, a MacBook Retina in that suitcase? Because then yes. <laughs> if you have any other types of devices in that suitcase... Probably not. 
as long as it's one of the newer ones, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've got the big old heavy 15-inch MacBook Pro. Oh, wow. Yeah, time for an upgrade. Yeah, but it, I did take out the uh, the DVD drive and put in a second SSD drive, and that's really nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, is it uh, M. Foley or M. Or M. Foley? M. F. O. L. E. Y. One word. Right. One word at VMware.com. Yep. There you go. Okay. And thank you for working on the hardening guide. You're welcome. Let's see. I'd like to say it was easy, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for a job and on on doing extremely detailed work, become become someone who owns a hardening guide. <laughs> Live in a cave for months. Okay. Any more questions? With that, I'm going to go. Well, every time I say that. Okay. Let's see. No more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and cut off the recording.